What's up, YouTube? As always, welcome to the live stream. Tonight, I'm going to be having a discussion with uh, David DePino. He served in the Indiana Conference of Seventh-day Adventists from 1990 to 1997, in addition to serving as a military chaplain and a civilian pastor. He has a double major in religion from Andrews University and a Master of Divinity from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. We're going to talk about why he left the SDA church, uh, what that was like for his family, where he's at now, um, some of the concerns that he has with the Adventist church's theology. So should be a pretty good discussion. We're going to try and keep it pretty chill. Um, it's going to be a relatively uh, short discussion. We're going to try and keep it 45 minutes to an hour or so. And we will leave the last 20 minutes or so for audience Q&A. As always, I will prompt you when you can send those through. So don't do that quite yet or they will get lost in the stream. Uh, so I wanted to bring David on because I think it's beneficial for people to hear a variety of perspectives from various people who have left Seventh Adventism and not just mine. So I'm going to be learning along with the audience tonight as I ask questions. Uh, I want him to have the majority of the time to talk. Uh, but before I bring him in, a couple things real quick. Next Thursday, March 9th at 7 p.m., Jim Babber from Academy Apologia will be on with me to discuss the Adventist Jesus and Gospel. This will be sort of a kickoff, if you will, for where the content on the channel is about to be heading. So if that's a subject that interests you, which if you are a Christian, it should, that will be next Thursday at 7 p.m. on this channel. Quickly, if you could, be so kind as to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you can be notified when content like this is uploaded. It would be greatly appreciated. With that said, David, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, Miles. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to kick things off by you telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, how many years you were an Adventist, uh, all that sort of stuff, just so uh, the audience can have a better idea around who you are. Well, I was actually uh, married, or just, just recently married. Uh, I should say I started studying with Adventists a little bit before that, but, but we got married and we started attending uh, the church um, because I was already convinced at the time. That was uh, 1985. And uh, I was in the Marine Corps at the time, and I was a jet engine mechanic on EA-6Bs. Uh, they're retired now. Uh, that's off point, but it's uh, it's truth. And uh, so I wanted to be an airframes and power plants uh, mechanic in the aviation industry. And so when I got out of the service, I went up to Andrews University. And uh, at the, the first year, I didn't have the money to actually begin. So I, I got a job at a die cast plant, forklift mm -hmm. driver, and machinist. And I did that for a year. And when I was doing that, I was active in the local church and we were holding revelation seminars and things like that uh with with the uh seminarians that were in that area we were at the all claire uh, seventh day adventist church and i liked it i had a good time uh i have an outgoing personality and uh one night all the elders from the church came over to the house and they said why is it that you're going to be a mechanic and i said well i want to make enough money that i can be keep my wife from working and be active in the church and so forth. And they said, well, we know a job where you could do that. <laughs> and uh, it's called be a, be a pastor. So they all told me I could go to uh, undergraduate school and uh, become a pastor. I gave it some thought. And a friend of mine who was a seminarian had me preach at his church. And next thing you know, when I retired at the end of that year, excuse me, uh, registered for school at the end of that year, I went ahead into uh, the pre-seminary program, which was a double major in religion. Mm. And you took the Hebrew and the Greek at the undergraduate level as well. Gotcha. So oh, go ahead. Uh, that, uh, that started me off. I was, I had done some college in the Marine Corps, finished the program in three years. I was hired by the Indiana conference. Uh, I interned down at uh, Cicero uh, and then uh, came back and did my master of divinity for three years and uh, went back and took a took a uh, three church district in northern Indiana uh, mm -hmm. in 1990, about 1990. So how long were you a pastor? I was uh, pastoring in the local church um, from 94 to 97, uh, plus my internship year. 
and then for um, another four years as a Seventh Day Adventist chaplain in the Air Force. So seven gotcha. years altogether. Okay. And then you left in what year? I left uh, in, I would think, 2001 would be the year. Okay. Okay. So it's been, it's been quite some time. Yeah. Um, this may go without saying, um, but you, you never know. And so this is something I think former Adventists especially like to know. Current Adventists definitely like to know, but those who have never been Adventists may not know. What flavor of Adventism were you right. adhering to? Were you a part of the uh, postmodern, uh, what they would call like the liberal strain of Seventh-day Adventism? Were you a full-blown conservative, all-in, dipped-in-the-wool the type? I understand the question. That's really funny that you, you say that. Um, I was an evangelical Adventist. I okay. uh, I'd always understood I was saved by grace, that the Sabbath wasn't going to save me. Um, I thought it was a religious duty, but uh, even though I knew the theology of the Sabbath being a seal, I don't think I ever thought of it that way. It was for me, it was about Jesus died for me and that's the seal. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, but I did believe the rest of that stuff. Um, so no, I was not a wide eyed uh, Yuchi Pines. I don't know if you've ever heard of that place, that, that kind uh, uh, where I had to wear, uh, where my wife would have to wear the, the skirt down to just below the calf. Yeah. Uh, uh, white high, uh, calf high athletic socks. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the stairs at Southern university, um, the, I don't know if you've, you've seen those, you can actually Google and there's a picture. If you just put in Southern Adventist university stairs on Google, uh, a picture will actually come up of the, um, stairs that were half steps so that the women with their dresses didn't have to show their ankles going up the, the, the stairs. But, uh, I mainly ask that because, uh, oftentimes people will try to say, if you weren't in one of these strains or the other, you weren't truly an Adventist. You're not a true representative of the Adventist church. And so, right. um, but I think that as a pastor, you were a pastor in the Adventist church. Um, you understood the teaching correctly. I did. Um, yeah. Yes. And um, you, you went through their uh, collegiate institutions, their seminary. Um, so you were very familiar with the teaching. Um, before I get to the, the next question, I want to ask something, I guess, to preclude that because it will kind of speak into that question. Um, what caused you to question whether or not Seventh-day Adventism was true? Well, you know, my testimony is online. If people were to Google my name, testimony and Adventist, it would come up. And uh, it was written about the time that I left the church. But the funny answer to that is because I liked Adventism so much and I was comfortable with it, um, that uh, my light went out. <laughs> All good. That, that's uh, probably a good thing. It was blasting me. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's what made me feel comfortable enough to, uh, I had a good friend. His name was Clay Peck. He's pastor of Grace Place Church in Berthoud, uh, Colorado. Right, right um, and uh, anyway, so, I needed a speaker, a gospel speaker, somebody who could really share yeah. the gospel for my congregation that was a military chapel. So it was not a denominational program. It was, uh, I was the pastor of, that was the only ch Protestant chaplain at RAF mm -hmm. Crowton in England at the time. So I was gonna have a special program up in the hills and uh, this little retreat and I needed a good speaker. And I knew Clay was a great gospel speaker. So I contacted him, but before I did, I called up my endorser at the uh, general conference and I said, hey, I'm not planning on going anywhere. I'm very comfortable. I believe all of Adventism. And I'm gonna give Clay a call because he's such a gospel preacher and he's gonna preach to my congregation uh, for this weekend in, uh, in uh, I think we were in Wales at the time. Anyway, so, I thought this would also be a great opportunity for me to have an in with Clay and give him, you know, the truths that he needed to come back to Adventism. Mm. He had already left. And uh, so we talked probably two, maybe even three months. I had asked him way out front, nine or 10 months ahead of time to do this uh, in the military and with something like that, that's complicated with lots of parts and flights. You need to do it way ahead of time. And uh, he talked, he was a nice guy, very, very, uh, 
uh, tolerant of me and uh, goodwill. And he said this, he said, Dave, I understand what you're saying, but until we settle the issue of Ellen White, really, you can't honestly come to a conclusion that's, di that's different from what she said, even though mm -hmm. you say you only follow the Bible alone and not Ellen White, which is what I said. And uh, of course, there's, there's truth to that. If you understand that Ellen White is a doctrine within Seventh-day Adventism, you can't say, well, I only follow the Bible because you are attesting that you believe Ellen White is a, a prophet, just as the old, you know, prophets have to keep with the other prophets. So Ellen White's along with them. And you're going to see, you know, read back into the Bible, the coloration of yeah. Ellen White's commentary on scripture. So he said, read this article. And the article was the Israel Damon story. Mm. And it's online. You can get it. Uh, uh, so there's this fellow. His name is Israel Damon. And it's the 1840s, right after the disappointment. Uh, and he's preaching that you don't have to work anymore because Jesus is about to come. So, so similar to the Millerite movement. Um, I can't, I can't place the dates anymore of when uh, Israel Damon was preaching, but it's, maybe it was before 1844. I think it might've been. So he's preaching. Listen, it's, it's short time. You don't have to even work because Jesus is coming. Now, remember this is the 1840s in Maine. If you don't work, if you don't farm, they're all farmers. If you don't farm, well then in a year or so, there's going to be starvation. So it's illegal to be uh, a vagrant in Maine in the 1840s. And when they hear that he's around, because he's been identified as somebody telling people not to work anymore, which means starvation. I mean, just that, that little bit of time going back, the world was a different place. You know, yeah. they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have uh, trucks coming up from Mexico with all of our vegetables and so forth. So the sheriff came to that meeting that night to arrest Damon for preaching vagrancy. And uh, Ellen White, 20 years later, tells us what happened that night. And she said, well, as the sheriff came in, God wanted to be honored in this event. So he filled the room with light and <laughs> held Israel Damon to the ground. And uh, not one of us lifted a hand to, to uh, uh, hinder the arrest. But God held him down in the middle of the room. But the sheriff, he wouldn't give up. The sheriff would went out and he got more deputies and more deputies till he finally got nine, eight or nine people all together and himself mm -hmm. were present. And uh, Ellen White said that at that point, God's spirit was uh, uh, satisfied that his glory had been met and uh, he relented, God relented and, and the officers were able to take um, Damon out and arrest him. Um, well, two days later, what she doesn't know, writing 20 years later, well into her prophetic career, what she doesn't know is that Damon went to court two days later. And at that court, over 40 people testified. The uh, records were burned, but a very good uh, rendition of those uh, court transcripts is printed in the Pesquitas Farmer, I think it's called. So they have a good record of it. And these are God-fearing farmers. You know, this is, this is Maine. They're all, they're all church-going kind of folks. And the, the reading of the account is very, uh, very believable, very reliable, it, it appears. Well, he gives you a transcript account of what everybody said, all of the testimony. And uh, it's two days later, right? Now, remember, Ellen White says light filled the room, a, a remarkable miracle, right? And God held him to the ground while nobody lifted a hand to hinder his arrest. But none of the Adventists, you know, not Seventh-day Adventists yet, but none of the people that are Adventists, none of the people there that are there to hear Israel, Israel uh, Damon, offer one word of anything that Ellen White said when she wrote her story 20 years later. No one said the room filled with light. No one said they didn't resist. In fact, the sheriff said, all these Adventists jumped on top of him and I had to keep getting the officers in to pull them off until I finally was able to arrest him. <laughs> um, now, in logic, there's something called uh, Occam's razor. 
Yep. You've heard of that. Oh, yeah. And basically, the simplest explanation is usually the truth. So should we believe, uh, number one, that the sheriff went in and was willing to do battle with God? <laughs> and that, uh, you know, when, when he realized Israel was being held down in this room filled with light, that God was holding him down and uh, the spirit of the Lord was in the room, as Ellen White says, that didn't change his mind. He's decided that he's going to fight God. And so he keeps getting more and more deputies until he finally pries him off, up, off the ground out of God's, God's hands. That's hard to believe that that uh, sheriff was, was that uh, blasphemous that he would be willing to fight yeah. against the will of God. <laughs> but it's also hard to believe that somebody of the 17, I think there were at least 17 Adventists who testified in the court, it's, it's hard to believe that not one of them countered his testimony that they held him down. Wouldn't somebody in the, in the uh, Adventist group there have thought, well, that's not what happened. Uh, the God's light filled the room. We didn't jump yeah. on top. And the fact that they jumped on top of them made them re guilty of resisting his arrest, right? Um, Nothing in that story that Ellen White tells 20 years later that she puts to pen to paper 20 years later, nothing of that was reflected in the court transcripts. What was mm -hmm. reflected in the court, court transcripts was that the sheriff came in. They all jumped on him to keep him from being arrested. He pried him off with, as he brought in more deputies. He finally arrested him. When they went to court, they all agreed. Every Adventist that was present that was asked to testify agreed. Yeah, yeah, I guess. That's what we did. We we jumped on top of him and we we we, we didn't really want him to be arrested. Yeah. Now this is a problem. This is this is uh, it's it's not something where you can say, well, um, I don't understand it all, but I'm going to go with trusting Ellen White. No, this is something where she says, in the context of uh, her role as a prophet. She gives a factual account of what happened that night, but nobody there present agreed with it. In fact, they contradicted it. 40 people contradicted it. That's now, if I were to wake up one night uh, from a drunken stupor and 40 people that were honest, God fearing people, we have to assume that they were there that night because they wanted to know God's will. They were trying to be faithful, right? Yeah. If 40 people told me, listen, you uh, you got drunk, you danced with a cow, and you and, and you passed out. And, uh, much as I might not want to believe that, if forty people told me that and they united it and they were willing to place their hand on the Bible, yeah, then then I would say I would I would doubt myself, wouldn't you? Um, you've got to have one heck of an amount of faith to say Ellen White is right forty years twenty years later, and that the forty people two days later are all liars. Yeah. And they colluded together with the sheriff who arrested their speaker. It doesn't work. It doesn't wash. And uh, I read that article 17 times. I just mm. read it over and over. And I felt like I was in quicksand and I couldn't get out because I didn't want to leave Adventism. I was very comfortable. Right. <laughs> I was very happy. I liked the people. I liked the church. Uh, there was nothing bad about Adventism as far as I could see, except some of the mean congregation members I left when I went into the <laughs> chaplaincy. And so I struggled and I struggled and I struggled and I, and I started to read more. That now I, I, I spent three month, months working as a chaplain for 40, 50 hours a week and then studying and reading for another 40 or 50 hours. I, I mean, I was mm -hmm. up late, up, up early and up late uh, for months working on this. And it took me about four months. I had read all of the Adventist books and I had read the old detractors books, Can Write and all of those sorts of things. I read Walter Ray, but I read everything that the church had to say to respond to those things. Yeah. So uh, it was a lot. It was a lot of material. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of articles and things. And oh, yeah, I had access through the general conference who was helping me. I was working with them. Uh, to their answers, and they were sending me uh, copies of original things that Ellen White had written. And in the end, because I knew the gospel, 
and then I knew Christ was the center of scripture. When I realized that it was a, it was a factual account that Ellen White, uh, so here I, I've kind of, I've kind of come not to the point to cast off Ellen White, but to the point where I can now finally uh, weigh, reason, struggle with the writings of Ellen White in a more fair way without the bias of she's a prophet. Yep. The, not, not being able to say, uh, yep, I'm sure she is, but let's, let's actually look at the evidence. And early on, right after 1844, everybody's heard of it, but nobody really understands it. There was, uh, that, that hasn't looked into it, is something called the shut door. We just did a stream on it two weeks ago. Is that right? Seven years after 1844, the Adventists believed that if you weren't inside, so to speak, the first apartment, then you were lost. And so you were not in on the Adventist movement. You really yeah. couldn't be saved. And uh, there were, Ellen White now is not the only professing prophet in the early days. No. So there's another lady who says, listen, we've got this mm -hmm. wrong. The gospel's open to the world and God's shown it to me. Yeah, and Ellen and we, was upset she about it. The gospel, and so Ellen White, you know, that night she goes home and she has a vision, and she comes back and she says, "No, no, it, we've been preaching it right. The gospel is closed to anybody who hasn't been part of the Millerite movement, and so they can't be saved." Now, during that seven years, the small group of Adventists is working with the children mm -hmm. of. Uh, the, the Adventist group that may not have gone to meetings or whatever. They're working with their families, a few family members that are kind of on the fringes of Adventism. But they have decided the gospel is not going to go to the world. That's over. That phase of the gospel ministry is over. So yeah. when the church points out, well, look, they were trying to work with people. They're trying to work with people. There was only one group of people they were working with, and that was the families of the Millerites. There yeah. was no belief at all that the rest of the world could could uh, uh, be saved. Now, Robert Olson, who was the uh, director of the White Estate, what do they call that guy? They call him the director? Yeah, former director. Or, yeah, years ago, uh, he wrote a very, very uh, fair uh, analysis of the shut door. I don't know if you can still find what he wrote online because I look well, around. Well, David, that's, uh, you'll be pleased to, to know that's actually what I used in the stream. Um, and we went through that and you want to know something interesting about Robert Olson's, uh, write up. Yeah. It is fair and balanced in the sense that I was impressed with the, some of the quotes that he actually includes in there and admits to, um, you know what he doesn't admit to in that though, that is, is the altering of the second vision. The claim is the claim from them is that the first and second vision corrected erroneous doctrine. No, That's what the I was, first vision was, was was erroneous and fighting the truth that was correct the first. and the second vision of february 1845 which they again try to say corrected erroneous doctrines was the exact opposite so before we went through olson's write-up i took people through the manuscript that they eventually had to release due to the heat of ellen's second vision it's not the full thing but it's as much as they have released and so we went through and showed because the, like you said, the defenses that they've tried to say, um, she never claimed that the gospel was, was it was only the people who rejected the 1844 message. It was never the whole world. Right. But in the second vision, it was the whole world. Yeah. And she was uh, actually upset. The lady you mentioned earlier, she was upset that that woman was heartbroken over the lost world and felt that they were still supposed to go and take the gospel to them. Exactly. Because Ellen said that um, essentially you were going against what God had shown and, and what his will essentially was. Um, but yeah, that is online. People can see it. It's on the Ellen White Estate website. I'll link to it in the description box after the stream for people. When did who Robert also, he's passed away, right? Yeah. When I believe that. I don't know exactly when he passed away, but I believe that that write-up was from 2001. Really? Well, I'm wondering if there's been some rewrites to what's available online. Because as I remember reading it, and I read it multiple times, he admitted, because one of the things Ellen White says repeatedly, and if you go to my testimony, you can read all of the quotes that I have of her. She says, when I write, 
I'm not interpreting anything. I'm like a pen in the yep. hand of God. And I write it exactly yep. as he tells me to. There's no interpretation going through Ellen White's mind in her mind. She is, in fact, uh, dictating what God says. But Robert Olson, he knows that those passages are out there where she says she's a dictating machine, that she doesn't have to interpret anything. He knows that. Yet, when relating the vision, she gets it wrong. And he admits that she got it wrong. And he says, but that, that she would misunderstand God uh, as this young age uh, is is uh, understandable no yeah no god is a communicator and in order to communicate he has to communicate ideas that uh are not going to be passed on can you imagine listen moses i want you to give them these 10 commandments uh moses says i, I i'm sorry i only i could only hear nine that's good enough <laughs> yeah no that's not the way the pro prophetic uh office works so to speak we don't get to hear god misunderstand it and then as his spokesman give a faulty rendition of what he had to say that doesn't work that way yeah uh so here's that article folks for those that are curious i was off david um i look at a lot of dates so um it was april 11 1982 yeah. that this was oh, um written up um and like you said i i'm pretty impressed with uh some of what is admitted to in this article but um the thing I, I noticed that was missing was um, the the any sort of reference to the second vision, which again, um, people, you can read it online. We did a stream, me and uh, CMB, the ambassador uh, from a couple weeks ago. It's on my channel called uh, Spirit of Prophecy or Deception, uh, testing if Ellen G. White passes the biblical test of a prophet. And this is what I spent the entire time um, on my portion uh, discussing was exactly this, the shut door. And uh, so it sounds like, David, what you're saying is what led you out was the errors around Ellen White. Because it, it, it let me then evaluate Adventism on a fair footing. Yep. I came into Adventism with a high school education. I okay. left Adventism using the tools that I had been provided from a double major in religion and a master of divinity. Um, there's a joke in, in the former Adventist uh, world. Ellen White says the brightest lights will go out. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to say the, because uh, I know a number of former Adventist pastors and all of them um, said that the primary issue or they, the, even some that were studying to be pastors and didn't quite get there because they said uh, the Greek and Hebrew that they were taught caused them to realize that not true. Yeah. Well, I, listen, let's if I were to talk with an Adventist today, I'd say, listen, man, you can make your argument for Sabbath. You've, you've got an argument for Sabbath. It's, and it's a fairly good one. Um, I don't buy it anymore, but it is a it is a fair argument. It's certainly just as fair as anybody that would uh, argue Sunday. Probably probably better. Uh, it's all a straw man because it's not about one day. It's about rest in Christ, who's yeah. died to save us, the recreation, uh, yeah. just as every element of the old covenant is uh, supercharged, so is the Sabbath. And it's the rest that we have in Christ, Hebrews chapter four. Yeah. But, but if, you're, if you're wanting to argue for a day, I mean, Paul says, listen, some guy keeps a day and another guy doesn't keep a day, you know, yeah. to the Lord, let him do it. So I don't have a problem with, with, Sabbath keeping as such, but I have a problem and I, I really, cause I'll tell you, this is, uh, this is probably off topic, but cultic thinking that basically it's like a rut, uh, uh down a road that you can't get your tires out of it, You're just stuck in that rut yeah. and there's nothing that will get you out of that rut. I, I, I'm, I read my Bible f four hours a day on average. I really spend my time in scripture and I'm reading it through in the Hebrew and the Greek. And I'm trying to be very careful. And every day I, when I start, I say, Lord, give me insight, give me enlightenment, but help me to uh, know and to be able to understand scripture in a way that uplifts Christ. 
and that's what scripture is about. Scripture is about Jesus. I mean, from the beginning to the end, it's about Christ. Mm -hmm. And when people get what I call a cultic idea, it becomes about something else. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And uh, man, there's just like, there's so much there that um, my mind just goes like all over the place because so much of what you said is so good. Um, there's something you said earlier about, um, well, and it's, it, this specifically resonated with me because that was kind of the issue that I had as well. So I, uh, I was born and raised SDA. My dad's a seventh day Adventist pastor still, um, educated in their schools, uh, really believed it, really bought into it the whole, you know, as much as I could for my age, I got a little nominal later in life, um, and had a pretty radical conversion later on. And my initial instinct and pull was to go back to the SDA church due to my tradition. Um, things like the remnant, that sort of stuff pops into my mind um, as a freshly, what I would say, born again Christian. And I, I tried to essentially um, do exactly what you, you did. Um, I, I quickly realized that without the lens of the great controversy, I was coming to a totally different understanding of the scriptures. Yeah. Um, I quickly realized that because I was saying those same things that you were, of course. Um, no, no, we just believe the Bible. It, it's just the Bible. And I used to almost say that sometimes in a sense of like, in almost like a backhanded way to like other people who say that they don't really believe the Bible. Um, and kind of the undertones behind that was they don't have the spirit of prophecy. They don't have this. Um, these added details to what's already been revealed that we have to really correctly understand uh, the scriptures. And when I started reading the Bible um, without that, it made a uh, major, major change. And it eventually led me to realizing that you can't really have Adventism uh, without Ellen White, or you can't do what, what I call Adventist light. Right. Um, and well, James White, you know, he said, in his lifetime, Ellen White is the linchpin. And if, yeah. if she's removed, you will leave Adventism. That was his conclusion. Right. Which it, it's so interesting, man. I, I spend quite a bit of time reading the pioneers um, just because there's so much, as I'm sure you're familiar with. And yeah, I mean, he's not the only one that was saying stuff like that. So it's so interesting how far removed a lot of like modern day Seventh-day Adventism is. And it's natural. There's going to be splintering when humans are involved, given enough time. Um, and that's, you know, or, or sinners, but it's just interesting how she's such a foundational component to the movement. And I engage obviously with Adventists constantly. And, um, I mean, the amount of people I get who want to downplay her. Um, and, and I think something that's interesting too, David, is when that's done, you then also have to downplay the fact that, are you the remnant church then? You know, when I tell you that I, I, I've been reading scripture a lot and I'm so convinced that Christ is the key. You remember when Jesus was talking to the disciples uh, and some one, at one point he spoke to the Pharisees. He said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. And then on the road to Berea, uh, I, I think that's uh, where they were walking after the resurrection. He yeah. opens the scriptures and he shows them himself. So, you know, that passage in Revelation from a biblical context and only a biblical context, the spirit of prof prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It, it's so un it's, it just pops out at you that all of the prophetic witness is about Christ, pertains to yeah. Christ. That's what the spirit of prophecy is. The testimony of Jesus means yeah. <laughs> it's, it's to get in my testimony. I wrote this uh, can you imagine that your, your neighbor, you, you, you see a couple of things, a couple of points of information. You don't know, but you see a couple of points of information and you think that your neighbor is cheating on his wife. All right. <laughs> and so uh, you, 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 you don't know, but you, but you think that he is. And so you go over and you tell the wife, you say, listen, Freddie here is cheating on you. And, uh, you know, he's 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 trouble. When you find out that what really was happening was that the woman that came to the house was a veterinarian that was looking at his dog. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that uh, her car had broken down and she had to take it out, you know, just totally yeah. reasonable sorts of things. But I had jumped. Let's say I jumped to that conclusion. Can you imagine 
just using the biblical information, going out and saying, Sunday is the mark of the beast. Just, just the biblical information. There isn't enough information to say that. I mean, you really, really are way out on a limb yeah. and somebody's sawing. <laughs> that, that's Adventism in its presentation of what really matters. That's, that's yeah. it, right? And, it, you know, they inherited, I, I still see this today, like I said, reading the pioneers, um, they inherited a hermeneutic from their pioneers for the audience. For those that don't know, hermeneutic is just the, like the formal term for interpretation method. The way it's, the lens you look through the Bible. At. C- correct. And the Adventist church has an, a hermeneutic that promotes um, the didactic clear passages as being obscured and the cryptic passages as supposedly being crystal clear. I get Adventists all the time, which I'm sure that I don't know how much you engage with them still or any of that. But having been a pastor, I'm sure that you have obviously to some level. And I get that constantly. Um, It's just right there. You know, whatever verse in Revelation it may be from Revelation 12, Revelation 10, Revelation 14. um, It's just it's there by by quoting the verse to them. It just that's what it's saying. And you hit on it. And I touched on it a little bit earlier as well. Um, How important is the great controversy theme in Seventh Adventism? I feel like a lot of people on the outside, um, that's really the the thing to understand when engaging with them, to understand why they're arriving at the conclusions they are arriving at. What is the great controversy theme? If you read commentary, which is what Ellen White is, a lot on on scripture, you're going to tend to see scripture that way. You, you can't you can't help not to. Um, I'm I'm talking with people online and things right now about this uh, doctrine of dispensationalism. Have you heard of that? Oh yeah. And uh, in my in my opinion, there are very very si- great similarities between Ellen White <laughs> and the way she, she interprets Scripture to make everything about. Uh, the Sabbath, and uh, the way dispensationalists look at uh, Scripture and see yep. political Israel, yep. and not Jesus. Yeah, um, they always they they they. It's impossible almost for them to look at the passage and see its plain meaning, because they have been told and they have read so many times, and the people around them trust that it means something else. So. Years ago, I, I uh, was working with Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, I had had a, a lot of their old books and things. And I found a quote from the Watchtower that said that we have found, Watchtower had found, that if a person would read only the Bible and none of the Watchtower publications, that they would ultimately leave the uh, Watchtower. So we encourage <laughs> that they continue to read the Watchtower publications. Now, that is a... That, that's incredible admission. He felt that that was a good reason to keep reading the Watchtower. Wow. Whereas the reality for anybody that's not already in the Watchtower is that that's an amazing admission that you're not going to be a Jehovah Witness if you read only the Bible. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Well, Adventism is, is kind of like that. You could, you, I think you could become a Sabbath keeper if you read only the Bible and not Ellen White. It could be unlikely. Um, because the more you read scripture, the more you're going to find that Christ is our Sabbath. He, he is Israel. He's the embodiment of these things that uh, so many people are pointing out there and they can't see it in the person of Christ. Yeah. That's the day and age we're in. Uh, if the devil can get you off of Jesus and onto the Sabbath and onto uh, political Israel or you name it, whatever it is, yeah. or my denomination or something other than Christ then he's got you. And you may be saved, scripturally speaking, by the skin of your teeth, but your witness, its power is in Christ. It's not in, uh, you've got to come to my church. It's not in uh, anything that is not coming back to Christ and to his once for all finished work at Calvary. Amen. That's so true. Um, 
because it's not just with Adventists. There's lots of groups out there that have their own um, distracted focus that um, completely misses the mark. Um, what there may be an, a number on this, um, so you don't have to necessarily hit on all of them. But what sort of theological concerns do you have with Seventh Day Adventism? You know, you've read Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults, oh, yeah. and oh, he yeah. does list Adventism as a cult, but as heterodox. Um, ha- have you read Fudge, uh, The Fire That Consumes? I haven't. That, that is a wonderful book. You ought to read it. He's Church of Christ. And okay. uh, the English church comes through uh, the Reformation and becomes conditionalists. The yeah. European church comes through and they become particularists. So yeah. when America is settled during the Puritan time, we're essentially a conditionalist nation. We believe that you die, you rest in the grave, unconscious, uh, your spirit returns to God, but that's not your thinking part, and you go to and you go to heaven at the second coming. And America is two thirds that for quite some time until the large European migration of particularists, which believe yeah. they pop right off into heaven. Uh, my concern, since coming out of Adventism, is that it's okay to have tensions within Christianity and not have it all figured out. Yeah. Um, I'm still a conditionalist. I have looked, I, there was a point at which I wanted to get rid of that. I wanted to become a particularist. <laughs> I wanted to pop right off to heaven. The minute I, I left, you know, I believe that. I couldn't. I, the more I studied, the more convicted I became that, in fact, I, what I think is that the cults, those folks that are going to major in the minors, they find these issues within evangelical Christianity where they're lazy, where they don't spend a lot of time at the details because they kind of settled uh, and they, they pick on them and they're like loose threads. Yeah. And they, they, they can make, you know, let's say that you're, uh, I'll give you an example. Methodism comes out of the Episcopal, the, oh, yeah. the Anglican church. So yeah. in early Methodism, uh, they essentially taught that when you died, you rested in the grave until the resurrection. And you were not allowed, however, to preach that you went to heaven when you died or that you were uh, going to stay in the ground and kind of like uh, do a prose over what scripture uh, says. All you could do in Methodism because they recognized this tension was you could say what the Bible said. And mm. they would they actually had it in their book of discipline that you couldn't speak to people going right to heaven or staying in the grave. You simply could say what the Bible said. I thought that was really neat. Yeah. Uh, today, there is a laziness within evangelical Christianity where we we uh, uh, are the uh, purveyors of orthodoxy. And so Adventists who have a... a uh, uh, off kilter understanding about what is absolutely right will come up against something they see that's a little bit wrong, maybe that, and say, well, that, they're wrong on that. that you know, they, they obviously can't be right on these, on these other issues. Yeah. Yeah. But Adventism itself is the greatest example of why that's not true. Early in Adventism, here they are uh, pushing Sabbath, right? But they're pushing it from six to six, right? Yeah. Whereas the Seventh Day the Seventh Day Baptists have got it right sundown to sundown, and you're saying, well, they're Seventh Day ba- Baptists, they're good Sabbath keepers, but they're lost because they're not doing it within Adventism. Yeah. Uh, Seventh Day Adventism is saying, well, you know, we got the Sabbath now, and they finally get it right, we got the Sabbath. But at the same time, many, many, many of the early Adventist preachers are Arian; they don't even believe Jesus is God. Yeah. So they had significant false doctrine within the context of Adventism for decades. Uh, Ellen White's only a Trinitarian because, you know, she copied Trinitarian's work. Yeah. Well, it depends <laughs> on what you're reading. Adventism. What's that? Yeah, and it, well, it depends on what you're reading too. I mean, um, you know, you can find her saying statements that do sound orthodox, but then you can find statements of her saying things. It's like, well, if you have a proper understanding of the Trinity, there's no way that that statement could necessarily be true. Right. Or the um, issue of the scapegoat is a good example. Too. Yeah, ex- exactly. Um, their defense to that is, no, 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 no. She never officially published the statement saying Jesus is the scapegoat. Huh. That's the defense. I just did a short uh, YouTube short on this in the schools and that it's believed yeah. within that. <laughs> I know it. So uh, th- that's a good point though, David. Um, I think that 
that can be hard too for Adventists that are leaving Seventh-day Adventism. I've had a number who have been reaching out to me ever since I started my channel. Um, and that I think is one of the common things that many of them struggle with is the idea that, well, you said it perfectly, majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. And believing um, that they're ever going to find somewhere where it's all right. I, I go to a yeah. non-denominational evangelical Christian church. And I would say most of the people, for instance, there believe they go to heaven when they die. And I'm, I'm different. I'm comfortable with that. And yep. so are they. Uh, yep. As long as you're comfortable and you are convicted on what you believe from Scripture, Scripture, uh, then there is room within Christianity for some differences of opinion. Um, but Adventism isn't like that. Uh, no. that you're, you're okay as long as you don't speak about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I, I jokingly will bring up sometimes on the channel or depending on who I'm talking to, you know, it's, you can be, you, and, and I want to be charitable when I say this, but I also want to be honest. Um, you can be a Christological heretic, but you can't eat bacon. Yeah. You know, yeah that, I, that's I, I a, would... that's a serious, you know, and I, and I say that in, like I said, sometimes in jest, but it's really to make a, a, greater point that I hope that sticks in your mind, folks, that you can understand the, where the emphasis is placed and the imbalance in what is a major and what is a minor, especially when we don't want to get off into this now, but especially when, again, you have clear didactic teaching passages that yeah. say the explicit thing to the contrary. Like then you have this as the Holy Spirit. C correct, which is said four times in the New Testament. Yeah, and so you have these very clear things, and yet that has to be obscured or it has to be made to fit uh, for this this paradigm. Exactly. So before we open it up to questions here, audience, you can now start sending those through. If you'll put a cue before your question when sending it, that would be great. I'm going to ask you one last question here while people get those sent through. If there's one thing that you'd tell a questioning Seventh Day Adventist, what would it be? What Clay said to me was true. You can't arrive at a different position than Ellen White. Uh, so you cannot study the Sabbath question. You can't study the sanctuary question. You can't study uh, anything essentially within the realm of doctrine until you have settled the issue of Ellen White. And the reason that you can settle it, it's not an unsettable question. When Robert Olson wrote his paper, he admitted Ellen White misled the people. That's what he admits. He's very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he gives her a pass. Scripture doesn't do that. Scripture says when a prophet misleads the people, they're a false prophet. And uh, there, there is so much information out there on the web. And you're you're going to have to be honest with yourself and work with the information that's out there and then also check in other places. I, I'll give you a great example. You, you have read The White Lie by Walter Ray. Yeah, I have. Walter Ray is a great guy. He's an honest guy, but he is also, um, he was a true believer. And so when he writes that book, he's, he is really angry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he it is comes so through. Mad. It that comes through. Half of what he could find was in other books, and she simply copied it because of the hypergraphia. That it does not allow him to see what I think. I, I, you know, have you read? You've read uh, uh, Canwright's work, D.M. Canwright. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Well, Canwright goes to his grave totally confused with Ellen White. He he doesn't understand. He says, yeah. you know, that here's this great Christian lady who has a good Christian spirit, and she's doing all these things that are not biblical right yeah and he goes to his grave like that and that is because he could not understand the implications of brain injury on a nine-year-old here this young woman the 17 18 year old girl is uh already uh being influenced by james white and some other strong personalities let's call them and it's it's the 1830s and 40s right you, you uh 
you don't have the kind of science and medicine that we have here. They don't understand hypergraphia. They don't understand brain injury. I honestly think that while she was a sinner and a, and a, and a, she was a false prophet, I, I believe that. I also believe that we'll see her in heaven. I, I personally do that she uh, sinned. She, she, I believe she was self-deceived. She really thought she was a prophet. And when she would go into these trance-like states and these different things would happen, uh, you know, who knows who was whispering in her ear and who knows that how the devil might have misused her, right? Uh, but she believes. She, I think she went to her grave believing she was trying to do the right thing. And that's the complexity that people don't understand about other people. Things are seldom black and white. It's black and white on the, on the facts. Ellen White was a false prophet. Ellen White taught false doctrine. That's fact. But understanding her psyche, one of the things scripture says is judge not lest you be judged. We can be fruit inspectors. We know the direction of people's behavior and whether it's good or bad. We know that. So we can make a decision, a good decision, and say we can't follow and read and trust what Ellen White writes. But we cannot say that she's going to be saved or lost because that is in the prerogative of God. And when we look at a confusing, complex brain injury patient, I think we can we can say, well, you know, let's hope that she's saved. Let's 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 uh, uh, give it to God. We can't say, you know, that she's a she's a horrible person. She look I, I, and and. This, this comes back to me, obviously. Do you know the story of King Manasseh in the Old Testament? Yeah. Manasseh. Um, I think he's Hezekiah's son, right? Manasseh yeah. is like the worst doggone character in the Bible. He has human sacrifices in the temple. He has all sorts of uh, things carved in the walls of the temple from pagan uh, ritual. If you can read about that in Ezekiel. Yeah. It shows them the things that are being printed there. And... Uh, he leads Israel and he misleads just about the whole nation. He's as bad as it can possibly be. And when he is taken captive and he's on his way to Babylon, he humbles himself, the Bible says, and he confesses and God forgives him and brings him back. Yeah. God is a great God. He's a great God. Yeah. And it's, I think you brought up a good point too, in terms of like, sometimes I think people can, and this isn't just within Adventism, this is just in general. I think people can um, mistake fruit inspection with uh, soul inspection um, yes. or heart inspection. And yes. um, scripture makes it clear that none of us can see anybody's heart um, and that there's no uh, any sort of judging that Christians are to do, whether that's uh, what Paul says in you know First Corinthians, the spiritual man judges all things, but is rightly judged by no man. Jesus in Matthew seven, um, that's talking about like you were saying um, the fruit, and um, saying well based on the fruit, here's what I think. But at the end of the day, I I obviously do not have one hundred percent knowledge of that because I don't have knowledge of anybody's heart. Right. Um, and I look at myself, and and you can do the same. How long was I wrong, but I was honestly wrong? Cor correct. Yeah. For, for well, years, I thought I was doing what was true. Um, the problem is people, mo most people, they say that only 1% of people after the age of 18 will be converted to Christianity if they haven't been exposed to it beforehand. Did you know that? No, but it doesn't it, surprise me. And and the truth is, as I look at, uh, there, there is a... Uh, very profound thing that people don't understand about the way that we perceive truth. Truth, we perceive truth as a very complex um, formula of what we know, what we don't know, and who we trust. So God is going to do, you know, the three surprises when we get, when we get there on, on, the, on the great uh, glorious day, right? That we're there because we know we were rotten and we were saved by grace alone, by yeah. faith. Yeah, that absolutely. the people we thought we were sure would be there aren't because of that reason. And th yeah. that it, it was appearances and people we thought would never be there are. Um, it, it, it is it is a humble heart before God uh, that seems to be the the key in all of Scripture. If you if you study that theme, this idea of surrender and humility before God seems to be one of the most powerful things uh, that scripture has to say about our salvation and our relationship with God. Yeah. It's not tricks. It's not, uh, you know, this one thing. 
it's this attitude. And we don't have that attitude because we're not willing to change. I can remember changing on all sorts of things. When I was convicted with the facts, I changed on Seventh-day Adventism. I'm open to change on any doctrine that I believe today if I have the biblical evidence to make me think differently. That gives you a tremendous confidence that if you're only after the truth, then what have you got to protect? Why can't you look deeper into the things that you think define you? Be defined by your humility before God, and then you'll have real growth. It's good stuff, man. Good stuff. First question here is from my friend, Test the Prophet. He asks, what sort of discussions did you, talking to you, David, witness regarding your colleagues having, uh, sorry, what sort of discussions did you witness your colleagues having when Prophetess of Health and the White Lie were released? Uh, Prophetess of Health, uh, Seeking a Sanctuary is another good one. Um, the White Lie, Prophetess of Health was already out when I was in Adventism. It was not something that was brand new, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And the white lie was already out. It had been out for some time. So uh, Prophetess of Health with Seeking a Sanctuary, if you, you've read that, yeah. Um, I've only read excerpts of that one. That's a good, that's a good read. Uh, Prophetess of Health is essentially, and it it's, a, it's kind of a funny book, wouldn't you say? It admits all of these things and then makes no decision to do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, it just it excuses them. <laughs> yes, yes. So, And the white lie is, uh, he's, he's what I call a baby with the bathwater kind of guy. He's, he's right in much of what he writes in the white lie. But uh, for instance, you, you know that uh, the white estate paid the royalties for the illustrations from yeah. the books that she copied around. So she'd copy the whole page and the other page would be some artwork. And the, the Ellen White estate would find that book because they knew what, what she had in her library. I mean, yeah. and then they would go and contact the, the artists and buy <laughs> so that they could put that same picture in the book that would then go out under her pen, yeah. uh, pen name. <laughs> uh, Ray made a big deal out of the fact that, look, they even copied the artwork. Yeah. He did. He mentioned that multiple times in the book, too. <laughs> so because he was so he was so ticked off about the copying where I was thinking, you know, uh, we're the we're the people who are, don't have brain injury. We're the people who have all of this information available to us at the touch of, a, of, a, of, a, of our phones. Right. We can look at that and not be upset and realize that, OK, if if seventy percent of, of what you write is copied from other evangelical <laughs> authors, right down to having it so doggone close that you use the artwork that's in the, the accompanying yeah. other side of the page, <laughs> then uh, don't don't be angry. Thank God that he made it obvious. <laughs> yeah, sure. that's good. Uh, Justin T. He it doesn't look like it's actually a question, but he says, even though I go to an SBC, that's Southern Baptist Church now, when I think Ten Commandment, when I think Ten Commandments, when I read my commandments, I'm still not 100 percent confident I can bet my salvation on the Adventist being wrong. So I'm not sure if there's a question exactly there. I think I know what he's talking about. The. There is a strain. I'm, I still have my membership with the SBC uh, out in Nebraska, probably unless they, uh, they, they let me go because I haven't been at the church for a long time. But when I was a wing chaplain at my last base, I was so mad that they were changing the uh, sexual stuff for, for the chaplaincy, for the, for the uh, Air Force, mm -hmm. that I assigned one of my Protestant chaplains to the congregation and had them be, become the pastor. And I just wouldn't attend to the chapel anymore. I was really upset about it. So I went to an SBC church. It was a great church. Um, there is there is an element within evangelical Christianity of legalism. Oh yeah, and so yeah, Adventists aren't the only uh, 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 culprits, are we? Or were they? Are were, were we? <laughs> oh no, there There's is. A... There, and and I would I would point out this whole idea of dispensationalism it's a it's a like a um a throwback 
to these legalistic ideas about how God is working. And until you get to the point where you recognize you're saved by grace through faith in the person of Christ, in his accomplished work at Calvary, yeah. you're never going to be able to feel comfortable. And uh, uh, I, I go back to Manasseh again. When you realize Manasseh was saved after what he did, right? He's worse than you're ever going to be. <laughs> he yeah. was so bad. He was so bad. And then God just like, hey, he humbled himself. He surrendered before me. I got him. Let's bring him back. And, uh, you know, he'll be in the kingdom. This really rotten fellow that, you know, persecuted the, the prophets and had God's uh, overt messages to him. And he rejected them all until, the, you know, the only thing that... Uh, we, when we look at someone like that, and then we look at ourselves, uh, you haven't done any human sacrifices lately, right? No. <laughs> um, God is saving us by his grace. He is not asking us to do it all right. And when you find that confidence in Christ, that he is everything, that he is, uh, that, it, that it is finished, that it is finished, and you are able to rest in his finished work, uh, you'll you'll never you'll never have the kind of peace uh, that you want. And and denominational churches say these are the things that we must do, uh, and they are good guides for moral behavior. But the only thing that is going to be, get you saved is a surrendered, humil humble spirit before Christ and the revelation of his word to you. That's, that's, that's it. It's good stuff. I, uh, I want to piggyback just quickly before segueing to the next question on legalism is not confined only to Seventh-day Adventism. <laughs> um, I'm somebody who's done street evangelism for uh, eight years now or so. Um, and <clears throat> the common people that you'll see out on the streets doing any sort of street wits witnessing are either the black Hebrew Israelites or the Pelagians. Um, the Pelagians, the full on true Pelagians, um, they are almost identical to any other legalist group out there in regards to um, the focus, not being on Christ, but on yourself. And so that's so true. Legalism is not um, only confined to seventh day Adventism. Hey, thanks Justin for your question. The next one is from Joel. Joel asks, what is your opinion on the Sabbath and the other fundamental beliefs now? The, the other, I, I'm still a conditionalist. I believe when you die, you wait until the resurrection, your spirit goes back to God. Uh, and uh, uh, what what else is there? I mean, like there are the five things. What are the five things? I don't believe in Ellen White. I I think that the way evangelicalism teaches the the sanctuary, uh, the way I learned it at least, I I still kind of believe that that Jesus is the sanctuary, that his ministry is the embodiment of the sanctuary type, and uh, I don't see any buildings anywhere. I just see Jesus now. Uh, I think that's what I saw then, I, although it's been 20 years. I, maybe I, maybe right. I did. Uh, Jesus moving through apartments up in heaven. No, I don't see any of that. The reason he's able to sit down is because he is the yeah. sanctuary. He is the temple. Well, and, and it's well, and the author in Hebrews goes to make the point in Hebrews 6, 19 through 20 um, to mention Melchizedek and the curtain that Christ entered behind after the order of Melchizedek. Um, Ellen wants to tell you that that is a different curtain that separated the courtyard from the outer apartment. Um, but the issue with that is, is only the high priest was allowed into the most holy place. And that's why Melchizedek is mentioned there, that the curtain Jesus went behind after the order of Melchizedek was that curtain that only the high priest could go behind, which was into the most holy place. But, and that's because that's he's the embodiment of it. And Melchizedek wasn't yeah. ministered in a sanctuary, but no. he had a personal relationship with yeah. God. So he was therefore behind the curtain. And Melchizedek was a priest king, like Jesus is a priest king. Yes. Yes. Thanks prophet, for the question, Joe. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. Oh, on the Sabbath, the Sabbath, Adventism capitalizes on the false doctrines of Catholicism saying that they changed the Sabbath to Sunday. Uh, okay, so 
let's agree for a moment that Catholicism has got it wrong, that uh, there's all sorts of false doctrine within Catholicism, and this is one of them. It does not then mean that the obverse is correct. What it means is, okay, that's false. Now, what are the complexities about it? And the complexities are that that's a straw man. This You, you, you set up a straw man through the false doctrine of Catholic, Catholic uh, Sabbath keeping on Sunday and say, no, no, no. The, the, the argument is it should be Saturday. Well, yeah, okay, fine, you're right. Uh, there's no argument for Sunday, but according to the New Testament, there's no argument for Saturday either. Right. So Adventism takes one thing and says, see, the, uh, the averse is true, yeah, when in fact point. that's the case. It's a straw man. Neither of them are the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the rest we enjoy in Christ today, now. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe... I don't know how long ago, but this fellow Manasseh, <laughs> yeah. when I realized that he was saved the way he was saved, it, 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 and, and it made God more powerful somehow, more, more abundant in grace somehow. And I, I think I understood God's character after I saw that, that he is not looking for us to get everything right. He's looking for a humble spirit before him and to humbly submit to the truths we know in Scripture. Well, this qu next question, which is kind of a question, um, but a little bit of a statement as well, we'll piggyback right into that. This is from April over at the Standard of Truth podcast. Welcome, April. Thanks for being here. She says, the question is, though, did Ellen trust in Christ alone for her justification? Her writings and the fruit of her life say otherwise. So would you say that if somebody is sincere, can they be sincerely wrong? Can somebody's, uh, well, I know a lot of Muslims. I know a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. I know a lot of atheists. I know some Buddhists, many of whom are sincere, but they can be sincerely wrong. So do you think that if Ellen White was proselytizing a false Christ or had a false Christ, um, she she's not saved, but you're saying you, there's no way for you to possibly know whether or not internally she did or did not? I think that the statement is right. Her writings uh, definitely say that she was not preaching Christ alone by faith alone. That seems yeah. to be pretty clear. Yeah. Um, I would go back to what I said. Uh, if, if we were saved in some sort of legalistic uh, uh, mathematical equation, Ellen White's lost. <laughs> right. Uh, but if we're looking at the God of, of mercy and grace in the person of Christ who saved Manasseh, well, then I don't know. I hope she's there. I right. hope she's saved. And I hope uh, as, to win as many as possible, you know, th that as many people are there. That's the heart of Christ. And so he's looking for ways to get you in, not ways to keep you out. Yeah. That's all the questions for tonight, folks. Thank you so much for being here, David. I know that we went a little bit over an hour, and so I hope that wasn't too big uh, of an issue I'm for very you. Very comfortable. Thank um, you. Yeah, uh, it, it was great having you. And like I said, I hope this conversation was fruitful for um, the variety of hearers. Uh, I know that um, it, it can be nice for people all across the spectrum to hear more than just my opinion. Um my thoughts on things. And so I'm always grateful when people will come on and give me some time, especially people who were pastors in the church. Um, and so any final words that you have for the audience, and then I will let you go and I'll do my final sign off after letting you go and we'll close it down for the night. Okay. Real quick. When I left Adventism, of course, I was 20 years ago, much more conversant in the details of what we're talking about tonight. So you can read my testimony and you'll see some of the arguments that I got front back from the church because I recorded their, their, I, I didn't want to talk to them in person. I had them write their things to me. And that way I had a record of what was said. Um, but I spoke with a number of Adventists. I, I was, I'm very convicted. I have absolutely no misgivings about my decision to leave Adventism whatsoever. And uh, as a result, three other Adventist pastors left with me uh, over mm. a course of years, we would talk, but with the ones that wouldn't, the reason that they wouldn't was disappointing. They'd say, well, I have my whole life in this. I see what you're saying, David. I have my whole life in this. How can I change now? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I guess Manasseh could have said that, couldn't he? <laughs> you love Manasseh. Yeah, I do. <laughs> the willingness to humble our hearts. You know, I, I don't know how many uh, hospital rooms I've gone into and somebody is on their deathbed and they're dying and I'll say, so do you know the Lord? And they'll say, nah, and it's too late now. And I would say to them, it's never too late. God talked to the thief on the cross. He talks to you. He talks to me. Anybody that will humble their heart before God, he will save them. And uh, they don't have to do anything like the thief on the cross. Uh, if you're willing to follow truth, if that is your attitude, and you're not trying to defend how you define yourself within a denominational structure or within your family, if, you, if you're not... If, if it's okay with you to say, I'm sorry, listen, as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor for, uh, from 85 until 2000, that's over 16 years in the church, right? How many yeah. people did I have to go back to and say, I was wrong, I'm sorry? Well, you're human. We're all human. We all, we all fail. And we've got to be able to willingly confess our sins before God. Well, sometimes we have to be willing to confess that we've been wrong to other people. And scripture tells us to do that. But as I was saying with the thing about 1% and 18 year olds, most people don't change. <sighs> most Christians don't have a surrendered heart to actually look at themselves objectively and say, what really is defining who I am? Is it, is it my associations with these, with these people, with this, with this structure, with that building? Um, with these things that I believed all my life, or am I defined by a simple humility before God now? That's, that's the difference. That's the, that's the important thing. And if you can say, that's who I am, and the rest of these things mean nothing before God, God will show you truth. Amen. Thank you for being here, brother. Um, enjoy the rest of your night, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Miles. God bless. Yeah, Take care. you too. Bye. So there you have it, folks. I'm really grateful for him coming on tonight. Um, I hope that that was fruitful for you all. Um, I think that, um, like I said, conversations like this are beneficial for a variety of people, whether it's former Adventists, current Adventists, uh, people who watch the channel who've never been an Adventist. Um, a couple things to commentate on tonight's stream. Um, one, I, I didn't coordinate with David before this discussion. And so you heard it from his own mouth. Um, the shut door Adventist, you really got to get real and honest about the shut door. Um, think about it. Just think about it. I'm not going to go into a, a rant on that. We've already done that for those who are curious about that. Doing a granular deep dive, the stream is on my channel. It's called uh, Spirit of Prophecy or Deception. Does Ellen White pass the biblical test of a prophet? So you can check that out if you would like. Um, I've had a couple people who were asking me as well if I would stay on after some of these and answer your questions. So I'm happy to do that. If you guys send some through, I don't know how much time I'm going to have doing this. But um, if you do have questions you want me to answer, I will try and answer them as best I can. Um, I don't want to go into a big, long monologue or anything like that tonight, but um, happy to ask questions that you might have. Um, the second thing I wanted to commentate on, um, you heard tonight that it's okay to have differences. There are things that you can disagree about and still lock arms. We need to major on the majors. And then this gets into the discussion of what the majors are. And I typically say this at the end of all of these streams, and I've said you guys are probably going to get sick of hearing this. Hopefully that's not the case, um, because this should be music to your ears if you are a born-again Christian. Um, this channel is about who is Christ and what is the gospel. We don't have to kick people out of the kingdom and Orthodox Christianity for not being in perfect lockstep on a bunch of secondary doctrines. David said things tonight that I disagree with. If you've watched my videos on this channel, you know my, my position on Ellen White. You know how I feel about that stuff. But it's okay for people to have a varying opinion. I know that that's not necessarily a theological point, 
but it's okay for people to disagree on the minors. David and I are united in who is Christ? What is the gospel? We have the correct God and the correct gospel. That's what unites us in Christ at the end of the day. David's a, as he said, um, he, he doesn't believe in the interme- intermediate state, if you will. I do. I'm not going to divide with him over that. I'm not even going to argue with him. I'm not going to argue that really with anybody, to be totally real. But you can have a unity around the foundational things, and that's exactly what um, it should be. We should be united on the foundations, not divided on um, secondary issues um, that the Adventist church, unfortunately, has elevated to be um, primary issues. Um, I don't see, I know that the live stream is a little bit behind in terms of um, where I'm at and what you guys are hearing. So if nobody has any questions, I will shut it down for the night, but I will give a little bit more time for people to um, have a chance to send anything through. Maybe the live stream hasn't caught to that part yet. Uh, Just a reminder, like I said earlier, uh, Jim from Academy Apologia is going to be on the channel next Thursday, uh, next Thursday at 7 p.m., Uh, We're going to be talking about who is Christ and what is the gospel, which again is precisely what this channel is about. And so if that interests you, which it should, you should um, definitely tune into that stream. It's going to be a powerhouse stream. We're going to be quoting all sorts of sources. My guess would be is that Jim is going to bring a lot of his library to the discussion. He likes to collect original books. Um, So hopefully... Hopefully, um, he'll be able to bust out some of those original sources for us on this area as we discuss and um, examine. So with that said, oh, I got a question here. Um, Have you ever been accused of sounding like someone famous? Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. If you mean like the sound of my voice, um... I don't think I've ever had, maybe maybe I have, I don't know. I've been told by a couple of people, which I disagree with this, but it is what it is. I used to get told when I was a kid and grew my hair out that I used to look like Bam Margera. Then as I got older and started cutting my hair shorter, I started uh, getting told that I look like, I've been told by some people, Kane Brown as well as uh, Pete Davidson. So not that I'm uh, necessarily thrilled about those, (laughs) Uh, I guess, doppelgangers. But uh, if that's what you mean, um, oh, I see that you commented on said Owen Owen Wilson. Um, (laughs) So I guess you think I sound like Owen Wilson. Um, Maybe I haven't listened to enough Owen Wilson to know what, his voice sounds like, but, um, thanks for the, the fun question. Um, uh, Justin says he thinks that method of baptism is a major, but I still watch answering Adventism. Um, yeah, I guess when I say, I guess when I say major, Justin, I'm talking about like a salvific issue. And hey, I guess, you know, some people are going to say that that is a a salvific issue. So um, I I point to Christ and the gospel because I can point to explicit scriptures that say um, outside of that, you're essentially outside of of orthodoxy. Um, But oh, yeah. And then somebody here actually commented in that thread as well. Joey, she said, uh, when we mean major, that's talking about salvational. So, yeah, I think baptism is important too, Justin. And I think that you're wrong on a baptismal method, but that's okay. I still consider you a brother. Let's see any other questions. All right, folks, I'm shutting it down for the night. It's all the questions. So as always, may God richly bless y'all and I will talk to you next time. Take it easy.